Welcome back to Alberta Primetime. I'm Emily Mertz. Tonight we have a very special edition of our Wednesday Vocal Point panel on crime. Joining us tonight is Fred Rayner, president of Rayner Consulting and former Edmonton police chief, defense lawyer Rod Gregory, and Calgary Herald crime reporter Jason Van Rassel. It's great to have you all here. Good evening. Good evening. As 2011 comes to an end, let's take a look back at some of the big cases, government initiatives, and events that affected crime and justice in Alberta this year. Let's start with the federal government's tough-on-crime legislation. The bill was introduced this year and has sparked a firestorm of debate from whether it's necessary and who will pay for it to whether it will increase Canada's prison population. Jason, in your opinion, what's the biggest implication of this crime bill? It'd really be difficult to, to overstate uh, the implications of this crime bill. I, I think it's going to be felt for years to come. Uh, we just had a think tank in Quebec uh, estimate the potential cost of this bill at $19 billion. And that just is an astronomical figure. We can sit here and debate about whether that is the actual figure or not and whether it's realistic. But here's the thing. We don't have a government that's really given us a realistic breakdown of, of the cost of this bill, which I think is vital when you consider that they're trying to put all these measures through at a time when crime is going down and in many ways is at its lowest since uh, the 1970s. So you really can't understate the, the potential implications of this bill and it could be felt for years to come in my opinion. Fred, so the $19 billion, um, what do you think the federal government's hoping to get out of that price tag? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think the federal government was frustrated for a long time sitting in a minority position and only really being able to tinker with regulatory matters and not having enough uh, votes in, in Parliament to, uh, to move a bill forward. So all that pent-up frustration seems like it pops out in the form of this huge omnibus uh, mm -hmm. bill. Uh, and probably there's a the bubble phenomena is has a price tag attached to it as well so they're in catch-up mode and there's a cost associated with it because it has so many different pieces to it I think there's things that you can view uh, that with that you would most Canadians would welcome things around uh, uh, safeguarding young people and uh, uh, new laws that uh, deal with sexual predators either uh, targeting young people on the internet or something like that. So as changes in technology, the law has to change to safeguard young people. So I think those are welcome. I think some of the more questionable ones revolve around the, those aspects of the omnibus bill that fall into the lock them up and throw the key away mm -hmm. category. And um, every, all the evidence down in the United States is suggesting to us that where they've tried that, it's not been that successful. Right. You've had all the cost and no benefit mm -hmm. and they're wondering why the Canadians haven't learned from the American experience for a change go figure there eh? uh, and uh, come up with a better mousetrap. Rod, legally was such a sweeping bill necessary in your opinion? Um, I'm completely against the bill I, I acknowledge some of the things that Fred talks about and there are some uh, serious violent crime has to be dealt with um, with general deterrence and general deterrence is when you're not necessarily deterring the person in front of the court but deterring others who might think about committing that crime so that's one of the main uh, sentencing principles is general deterrence deterring others from committing that same crime mm -hmm. having said that um, I uh, have to echo Fred that the mandatory minimum sentences are a complete throwback and have been a complete failure in the United States and my opinion is that it is nothing but politically motivated uh, as uh, Jason said the crime rate has been its lowest since 1966 and they're taking credit for the lower crime rate with the initiatives that they've done and when one thinks about the billions of dollars that can a um, go into a police force, go into crime prevention, go into rehabilitation, go into education, and um, it, it's really counterintuitive. And Americans have actually criticized the government for turning the clock back, and that's all they've done. And it's completely political, and I, I'm completely against the bill. And, um, for example, one of the mandatory minimums is um, a minimum six-month term of imprisonment if someone's producing marijuana with six marijuana plants or more. And as a taxpayer, I find it absolutely abhorrent that I'm going to spend 
um, thirty to forty thousand dollars incarcerating that person, and the provincial governments are going to have to pay for anyone who's sentenced for two years less a day or under. And so we're going to be bearing the brunt of those costs, mm -hmm. not the federal government. Very interesting topic. Another one that was making headlines in 2011 uh, was homicide numbers in Alberta, particularly Edmonton's shockingly high number. 2011 has seen officially 44 homicides. Calgary has recorded less than a quarter of that at 10 homicides. So, Fred, what is there anything we can attribute to this disparity and the, such the high number in, in Edmonton? Well, I think you look at the Alberta experience a number of years back here, three, four years ago in Calgary, they had a flare-up of homicide activity, which they could directly attribute to gang activity and organized crime activity. Uh, this experience in 2011 for Edmonton is different in that there's no single phenomena that you can point to and say, ah, it's, uh, you know, Aboriginal gang violence or it's exclusively uh, spousal violence. It's been a real smattering of all those mm -hmm. different things which makes it very challenging in terms of trying to find a uh, proper response to it. This one really needs the police, social services agencies, the community. If you're mm -hmm. going to turn things around, it's going to need everybody contributing to, to really affect a proper difference. Jason, you've been covering, um, obviously, crime <laughs> and uh, therefore homicides in Calgary. What are your take, uh, what's your take on the numbers? Fred's right that uh, authorities in Edmonton, whether it's the community police agencies, do have to present a united front and, and really get on this problem. But I think we can also maybe take a bit of a step back and wonder whether we've got a real statistical anomaly on our hands in, in Edmonton this year. And I would, I would say that in Calgary, with only 10 homicides this year, we've probably got a, a bit of an odd year going the other way. Um, certainly, a couple years ago in Calgary, 2008, 2009, we were up over 30 homicides, and, and Fred is correct, uh, a lot of that was driven by gang violence. But I can also take you back to 1992, when Calgary was a much smaller city, and we registered 32 homicides that year, and really there was no real rhyme or reason to it or single thing driving it. Uh, within a couple years after that, we were down into the, uh, the low teens and even into the single digits before the, the, homi the number of homicides slowly climbed again as, as Calgary Calgary's population did. So it'll take some time, I think, to, to know whether Edmonton is on, uh, is on a path that is really concerning. Certainly this year, uh, a lot of concern for Edmonton, but whether it's an ongoing or concern or not, I think is a little too soon to tell. Uh, no, you know, no number of homicides is, is acceptable, and, and 10 in Calgary is, is equally, or not equally as tragic, but it's certainly a tragic number. We wish we didn't have any, but it is lower than we're, 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 nor we're used to seeing. And you can attribute that partially, I think, to a real, uh, a real decrease in gang violence here in Calgary since 2009. We've got just about a minute and a half left, but I want to get your thoughts on kind of the top uh, crime events that, that rocked Alberta in 2011. Rod, uh, what's your pick? Well, going back to the homicide, certainly there were some really sensationalist um, cases. There was Twitchell this mm -hmm. year. And the troubling thing about some of those are the copycat aspect to it and, and the bigger picture of what um, mass media and society is projecting um, and how it's affecting uh, people in society. Mm -hmm. Fred, what is the challenge of a, of a, a police force when media and public attention is so, um, so glaring? Well, I think, uh, as always, I mean, the police are used to being scrutinized in terms of their behavior and action. I think as a community, uh, it's better that the community is informed, mm -hmm. knows what's going on, educated so they understand what's happening and able to uh, decide what kind of contributions they can make in mm -hmm. terms of turning things around. Far better than the ostrich sticking its head in the sand. Yeah. Jason, what cases uh, grabbed your attention? Two here in Calgary. Uh, the first would be uh, the trial over the uh, Bolsa triple shooting on, on New Year's Day in 2009. Of course, this was the, the bloodiest episode in, in Calgary's long-running gang war. And we had uh, two, of the, two of the four accused go on trial and, and both of them convicted of first-degree murder. Uh, that, I think, is a real watershed uh, for the, the law enforcement fight against gang violence here in Calgary. Uh, the second trial is still ongoing, and that's the, uh, the Dustin Paxton torture trial. Paxton, as you recall, is, is accused of, uh, 
of torturing uh, and, and starving and abusing his long uh, his roommate over a long period of time, both here and uh, in, or both here in Calgary and in Regina. Of course, the course, the case came to light when the roommate was dropped off near death at a hospital in Regina. This trial has actually gone on longer than the Bolsa triple murder trial, and at the risk of making light of what's some very serious subject matter, it really has had a lot of twists and turns, like a, an episode out of Law and Order. We've had uh, we've had testimony about. Uh, 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 police sitting in the gallery possibly coaching witnesses. Uh, we've had uh, testimony about whether uh, the court uh, uh, contact between the court clerk and the victim and now we, we've got some testimony about some of the actions of the lawyers and, and so it's just ta uh, taken every conceivable twist and turn and the case still isn't done. And Jason, thanks. I'm going to have to stop you there. G fascinating cases for sure and gentlemen, thanks once again for your input. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this look back at crime in 2011.